Hey everybody, today is Monday, April 13th, 2020. My name is Matt Fury and you are listening to The Rough Guy. Okay, time to get this podcast machine going again. Good to see you. Thanks for dropping by. Hope you enjoyed last week's episode on Tiger King. I know a lot of people did because they certainly heard a lot about it, so thank you for that. Going to try something a little different this week. Uh, Instead of focusing on a project in terms of a film or TV show, we're actually going to tackle a topic, which is something we haven't done in a while. In fact, I think the last time we did that was around... Oh, late summer last year when we talked about uh, unscripted television with our cool reality TV friends. That was a lot of fun. If you haven't heard it, check that one out. Uh, But today what I thought we would do, since so often on this show, when talking to editors, picture editors anyway, we talk about sound and their approach to sound and the kind of sound work they do in picture editorial. And so I thought it was kind of high time that we jumped in and talked to some audio post people. In fact, we should have had a panel at South by Southwest. I know I talked about it in some of the previous episodes this year before South by was canceled. And I thought what we would do is, even though we couldn't go to Austin and actually have the panel there at South by Southwest, there's nothing to stop us from doing it virtually. In fact, everybody's doing the Zoom thing these days. So I got the gang together uh, for today's podcast on the psychology of sound design. And where I usually have one guest on the show, we have not one, Not two, but three very talented people joining us here today that take on the role of re-recording mixer, sound designer, and sound editor on a lot of the films that they do. First would be Ai Ling Lee, a very accomplished re-recording mixer, sound editor, and sound designer. She's done films like Jojo Rabbit, uh, La La Land, First Man, Deadpool, all kinds of great stuff like that. Also, we have Will Files, who just did The Invisible Man. I know we had a podcast on that recently with editor Andy Canney. Uh, Will's done all kinds of big movies, Uh, Star Wars, The Force Awakens, War for the Planet of the Apes. Uh, He's on Stranger Things, and I'm not sure when it's going to come out, but he's also on the new Ghostbusters, Ghostbusters Afterlife. So I think we're going to see that in 2021. So a little bit more of a wait for that one. And finally, we're also joined by Craig Hennigan. Uh, Craig also works on Stranger Things uh, with Will Files. He's also done films like Roma, Tropic Thunder, and I believe he also worked with Ai Ling Lee on Deadpool. So those are our very esteemed guests today. They've got a lot to talk to us about in the world of audio post-production. So let's not wait. Let's jump right in. Here are Ai Ling Lee, Will Files, and Craig Hannigan. In Austin, Texas. You know, so this is basically virtual South by Southwest without the brisket, unfortunately. Um, You know, it would have been great for us to be in Austin, Texas right now doing this in front of a South by Southwest audience. But, uh, you know, if we can find a silver lining in all this, it's that maybe we can reach a lot more people doing it this way. And we got a lot to talk about. I mean, digging into the psychology of sound and how the work that you do in films and in television shows impacts an audience. um, That's a lot of ground to cover. But uh, before we do that, I thought the best thing we could do is really sort of break down some of the mystery around the different roles in audio post-production. And when I look at your collective IMDb pages, um, you see three titles that come up a lot. And that's, you know, sound designer, sound editor, re-recording mixer. And oftentimes you have all three of those titles next to your names in the credits. So what I thought we would do is start off with a little role playing. Um, And what we're going to do is like, I'm starting a movie and I'm going to hire each of you to be on the movie. And you're each going to do one of those different roles for me. And I'd like you to explain what it is you're doing for me. So I Ling Lee, I would like to hire you as my sound designer. What does that mean? What will you be doing for my film? Um, I would say I would try to, no, familiarize myself with the, the story, the script, and then um, converse with the director um, about, you know, what his vision is, his any inspiration, his um, palette for um, thoughts and ideas uh, on the sound, and um, to create, like, um, a collect and create sounds that could convey a certain emotion, you know, it could be... Um, horror thing or a musical or anything um, if they wanted more reality based uh, grounded gritty or mm, much more surreal uh, or subjective and um, to maybe then after that conversation like start you know um, brainstorming and maybe 
finding out you know things to record um, and uh, to try to use as much original sounds as we can uh, to make a clear choice to convey the um, the core emotion of the scene and the and the movie or any main characters that could um, where the sound could help. Okay, and now, Mr. Hennigan, you have the duty of being my sound editor. What will you be doing on our film? As a sound editor, supervising sound editor? You that, could be supervising. Yeah. We'll get into the... Or, or just a supervising. sound editor. Or, 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 or there's a lot of sound editing. Okay, so sound editing, I mean, the the sort of basic look at sound editing is is uh, the food groups of, like, dialogue editing, uh, which can be split up into sort of production dialogue editing and ADR, or loop, uh, loop um, type editing. Uh, and then there's sound effects editing, um, and then there's also Foley editing, uh, and then sound effects can encompass uh, the hard effects, you know, stuff like doors, closes, and, and cars, and engines, and guns, and stuff. Uh, and then backgrounds and atmospheres are also part of that sort of sound effects sort of world, like creating, you know, um, if the scene's a rain scene or, a, you know, um, whatever type scene that, that you sort of need to flesh out the ambiences and create the sort of world that these characters, the storyline inhabits. Um, sound editors often work closely with the sound designers. Uh, quite often sound editors and sound designers are, the, are somewhat the same sort of thing in, in a lot of different types of projects. Um, you know, sound designers a lot of times will, like as Eileen was alluding to, like focus on uh, specific tasks within the project, um, you know, that take a little bit extra special care, extra special sort of time to sort of develop the sound design aspect. At the same time as that's happening, sound editors are cutting all the other stuff that needs to be cut in, in a film or a television show. Anything from, like I said earlier, anything from all the regular sound effects to atmospheres to the dialogue to the production dialogue needing to be cut and edited and cleaned up. Uh, and then an ADR supervisor would come in and, and uh, cue all the ADR and shoot all the ADR. All that needs to be cut. Foley, the Foley artist is performing all the Foley the footsteps, you know, uh, human movement, what have you. That uh, material then needs to be cut and put in sync um, with, uh, generally needs to put in sync, obviously, with the picture, but also in sync with whatever production sound or whatever sound effects that the sound editors have cut. Um, so in a nutshell, that's sort of, you know, the broad strokes of what, what a sound editor will do. Okay, and of course, Mr. Files, you're going to be our re-recording mixer. Tell me about uh, what you bring to the table. Hmm. I, I sometimes think about it in like visual terms. If you think of the uh, the sound editors and sound designers being the the set decorators and the art directors that are assembling all these wonderful things that you have available to you as a cinematographer to shoot, and then depending on how, what lens selection you use and how you choose the light to fall and all that, you're going to interpret those things for the audience's experience. So that's a lot of what we do with mixing, is we take all these things that we've assembled, all these sounds that we've created and recorded and meticulously cut into sync, and then you decide from moment to moment what the audience is going to hear. And, and a lot of the choices behind that are driven by story. Um, obviously, you always have to hear the dialogue nice and clear. That's the most important thing, and the music is gonna do a lot of the emotional support but then there's a tremendous amount of storytelling that you can do with sound effects and how you choose to either focus on something or not focus on something, um, where you put it in the room, you know, if you're putting reverb on it to make it feel like it's in that space. You can say a lot about a space with the reverb. You can tell the audience what that room feels like, you know, and, and sometimes that's a literal choice, like, oh, this needs to sound like a big church. And sometimes it's more of an emotional choice. Um, that you're trying to make the scene feel a certain way. Uh, so we use reverb to do that. We use you know EQ to shape the sound of things and to try to match different pieces of dialogue together that were recorded on different days, different you know sides of the world sometimes. So basically the 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 mix is the end of the funnel, right? That's where everything, all the things that we've been working on for weeks and weeks and weeks, they all come together and we all sit in a, in a movie theater basically and watch the movie over and over again and make choices about what we want to hear. Okay, so you, you all did a great job of breaking down each of those roles as an individual function, and yet oftentimes each of you does, them, does all three of them together. What dictates when um, you might be one or two of those things versus like I'm doing all of them? 
I mean, to some degree, it's a bit of an artificial distinction these days. Um, like Craig said earlier, it's like some, sometimes it's really hard to draw the line between sound designer and editor, and it's equally hard to draw the line between sound designer, editor, and mixer. Um, and part of that's because of Pro Tools, because basically as soon as, as soon, if, I, if I'm approaching a scene and I, I go out and I record some source material, I bring it back and I use that to make some sounds, and then I'm going to cut it in sync, and then I'm going to start putting some EQ on it and some reverb on it and start mixing it into the, into the movie. That all happens in the same platform now. And, and it, it, it's all part of the same creative process. I mean, I don't know about, about you guys, but I find it really hard to, to, to not mix as I cut. Same for me, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and, and it helps. Um, I mean, you know, um, historically, you know, with, due to technology, um, for film sound, um, you know, supervising editors used to like cut a broad range of sounds and then the mixer would then like pick and choose or eh, together with the supervisor on the stage, pick and choose on the sounds on what would work together on, on screen um, during, during the mix. But now, you know, like Will said, you know, with Pro Tools, you know, the technology, I feel like um, mixing it as I'm cutting helps me determine what sounds would work better uh, and whatnot, and to fine tune it even more as we go along. It's a forward, like it's just a positive thing. It's just um, you you build forward towards fine tuning. And there's also the other benefit of kind of how we do it is the relationship with um, with a director and the picture the picture editor and 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 developing uh, that language that sonic language early on for them. I think is really important in a lot of directors. Yeah, I know I've had directors that are like, why wouldn't you do it this way? Why aren't you working yeah. on the sound design and the mixing? Why, why is it, why is it I work months with you and then we have to turn it over to, you know, a, a mixer and no disrespect to that mixer, but how does that person now get the shorthand of what we've been working with for, you know, however months. many months or weeks. So, yeah. um, definitely, I think, you know, I, you know, speaking for Eileen and, and Will, I think the three of us specifically got into what we do because I don't think we think about it any, like as departments or, yeah. or contextualize it as individual things. It, it's, it's sound, it's sound for the film and, and, uh, you know, looking at the artistic and the creative, uh, freedom that allows us to do that to create the ultimate soundtrack for, you know, the directors that we work with. Um, it's kind of the only way to do it, you know, is to be the supervising editor, to be the sort of lead designer and to be, you know, uh, at least, you know, one of the re-recording mixers and on all of us, um, we sort of specialize in sound effects, you know, the three of us are sort of sound effects oriented people. Um, and you know, a lot of, a lot of the times we're sort of the lead sound designer or the overall sound designer, but we also have one or two, really good sound designers on the project with us um especially on the bigger films that are just you know massive massive amounts of work massive amounts of changes just the technical you know just keeping up with changes keeping up with visual effects and, and stuff like that i mean there's a whole gamut of how you do what we do on an independent movie versus how how we would do it on sort of a studio you know big budgeted action movie um, but I can say that all three of us still bring the same amount of creativity and passion and, and sort of, you know, intellect to, uh, to each project, no matter the size of budget or what the show is about or whatever, you know, it's like sound is just sort of all in our blood, I said, yeah. essentially, you know. And I, I would even say, you know, workflow wise, it's, it's very similar between the, the lower budget indie stuff and the, the big budget, um, Studio stuff. The the main thing is the scale of it. Like, how many people do we have working on it? Right. You know, how long are we on? That sort of thing. But uh, you know, it's the same sort of process. It's just sort of in a more condensed timeline. So for picture editors, um, and I'm I'm going to apologize in advance for often relating things back to to picture because that's a world I understand <laughs> a little better. It's okay. Nobody understands sound. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's why that's why we're here. <laughs> that's why we're here. But that's I think you talked about you know as as being a sound designer and talking to the director about their vision. You know, mm. the editor will often be, picture editor will be brought in early to look at the script and consult with the director. What can you take away from those meetings with the director? I, I know that a lot of times directors will use other films as a point of reference to get across to the cinematographer, to the editor, to the set designers, 
to the wardrobe department. This is the aesthetic that I'm going for. This is the this is the feeling that I'm going for. Can you do that in sound as well? Is there a way to, to look at films or listen to films and say, okay, this is the, forgive the pun, the tone that I'm looking for? Yeah. Um, depending on the filmmakers, um, some do it a lot more than the others. Um, like say, you know, with Damien Chazelle, like uh, he would always have sound references even for sound. I mean, uh, film references even for sound. Um, like say this movie First Man um, that he directed, um, he would point to, like, he wants, like, you know, he would point to movies like Das Boot, Saving Private Ryan, um, a few other, um, like, uh, Son of Soul, um, not your obvious space movie choices, um, but after watching it, you kind of know what he was after, you know, to be immersed in the intense feeling of feeling the ship uh, creak and building and, um, and also to feeling the, the tactileness of some uh, Terrence Malick movies um, they would point out, um, or, or La La Land, who would say, like, Mean Streets. And then hmm. uh, I guess it's, you know, like, to hear, you know, the sounds of the city and hearing, like, source music coming out from different parts of the city, from the car, from the neighbor, you know, um, places like that. It's, it's, and it's always great when you're working with a director like Damien who understands that language but also makes movies that support those kinds of choices. Because sometimes we work with filmmakers who are like, make my movie sound like Apocalypse Now, but they've made Armageddon. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and nothing's yeah. wrong with either. Uh, I love both. Yeah. You know what I mean? I've also run into instances where sometimes you know, the memory of watching a movie maybe a long time ago yeah. makes it seem like, oh, it's a lot better and then they will go oh i just want it to be like you know this one particular scene this one sound in this movie mm -hmm. for this door open right. and then like you know from a 70s movie and then um you know, they all have good sounds back then too it, it's just the idea of it so but then like you play it and you go mm. yeah okay. <laughs> maybe you just have to take that yeah. as a yeah, it's almost like you have to go put put like you know go back in their head and try to figure out okay how did this make them feel and why yeah. and how can yeah. we do that now with the modern soundtrack? So the director gives you you know a sense of what their vision is, what they're going for. Maybe again giving you films to reference when they do that with a cinematographer. And Eileen, you even use this word palette. They have a palette to work with. They have lenses to work with to create certain emotions, certain feelings within the audience. Once you as sound people know, okay, this is what they're going for, what are the techniques, or what are the tools, how, how do you manifest that into what they're looking for? How, how does it, you know, the tools are always going to be the same or more or less the same. What is it you do to try and get that feeling? I think so much of it is just about the, the choices that we make about what sounds to use and how to present them. Um, like a movie like First Man was so successful at feeling very real and very like textured and it felt, you know, almost documentary-esque in some ways. Like, it felt very authentic. Um, and you could have done that movie with the, you know, super slick Hollywood style, and it would have undermined, I think, what the movie was trying to be. So it, it, all those are really just choices about... It's taste, right? I mean, I think a lot of yeah. why we get hired is for our taste at the end of the day. And, yeah. and our previous work and how it made them feel on certain projects, you know. Yeah, every movie is kind of different. So um, some you want it uh, much more greedier, so you would, you know, keep some overlapping dialogue. Every movie uh, you know, has a different thing, you know, um, you know like, uh, you know, uh, like Will said, like, uh, first man's more documentary feel. Uh, so you kind of try to um, pick sounds and make sounds in that fits and dirty it up to fit into the dialogue, the production track better. And in the mix, you may have overlapping dialogue that sometimes you may purposely, you know, not want to, it's of course up to the director. Um, uh, <laughs> when you have overlapping dialogue, you know, typically for us, you want to make sure like you hear everyone's dialogue clearly. Uh, but, uh, and sometimes because you want it to feel like a documentary, you like you're in a room hearing, a part of your conversation, you may want to have some overlapping dialogue lines that sometimes some lines can be throwaway lines. Um, so um, it's, you know, it's just a whole, you know, um, using different parts of, you know, it can be dialogue, can be music, can be sound. 
um, mm -hmm. the facts for the way. Yeah. Or, or sometimes you want it very slick um, and much more showier sounds, um, maybe um, for like a, a you know, superhero film or something. Um, Do you find that, um, and I know this again happens in, in the picture side a lot, um, that you become known for a certain type of film or a certain style of work is that, do you find that, that that has happened to you? And do you do you find that it's beneficial and that, okay, we know that if we're going for this type of movie, we've got to call Eileen, we've got to call Craig, we've got to call Will, or do you do you try and be as, um, have, have as a broad a spectrum of work you know, to your name as possible? Are there other advantages to either, you know, being known for either? Wow, well, I think it's just lucky to be working honestly i mean none of us <laughs> i mean you know none of us have agents right you know i mean there's not yeah. there's no there's no um there's no like hmm i'm gonna go I, I mean i guess you could i mean i didn't i just sort of naively just got into it and just loved what i did and you know with a little bit of good luck and and having good people around me i was able to sort of work on some interesting projects that would just build off of build off of that and build off of and keep building you know, I ha in my own career, I have like a, a side of me that's sort of this action comedy side um, stuff, like Tropic Thunder or, you know, even Deadpool and, and 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 films like that. But then I also have this sort of New York filmmaker, Darren Aronofsky, darker, you know, stuff like Black Swan or Requiem for a Dream, or, you know, that have a just have a sort of a different sort of style to it. So uh, that was no master plan, and on my part, I enjoy all those directors and and I, I enjoy every single project that i work on i i tend to bring if i brought something to an aronofsky movie that i you know nine times out of ten that idea or the whatever creativity i can apply that to an action comedy you know so to speak um i think we're all just very you know we've all worked really really hard and and we've all been very fortunate um but at the bottom line is we've each director that we work with the greatest compliment you can get for your work is actually to get another call from that director saying, you know, Hey, I, we have another film coming up. I really want you to sort of be involved with it and stuff, you know, I mean, I don't know. I mm -hmm. mean, Will, you spent some time at Skywalker. Was that a conscious choice mm -hmm. from when you, when you were younger that, you know, you needed, I want, you wanted to go to Skywalker because you wanted to be around, you know, Randy and Oh yeah, and definitely. And that, was, yeah, that, so. that was, yeah, exactly. And it was, it was because I wanted to be around Randy and Gary and Ben yeah. And learn from all those guys, and it was right. the you know it was the most amazing. These are veteran mixers, sound people at Skywalker Sound. Yeah, Randy yeah. To Tom, Gary rides from Ben Burt, um, yeah. and uh, you know those guys really kind of redefined what we do in in the seventies, eighties, and nineties. Um, you know they did a lot of really groundbreaking work uh, on you know movies that we all love, like Jurassic Park and Saving Private Ryan and Contact and. Forrest Gump and, you know, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, you know, the list goes on. Um, the right stuff, which I think, you know, in a lot of ways, um, the work that Eileen and her crew, crew did was a really cool, modern uptake on that kind of aesthetic. Um, so, you know, that's that, that's the kind of, I love those connections between the older movies and the new movies. Um, but getting back to the original question, I think that... In sound, we're lucky that we get to work on enough movies that we it's hard to get completely pigeonholed. You know, I think when you have picture editors and cinematographers, picture editors especially, they get pigeonholed to like he's a comedy guy or he's a um, action guy. And the reality is a good editor can cut anything. But they tend to, because it's such an important job, they do tend to get pigeonholed. And also they tend to be on the movies for a year or two. Whereas we tend to be on the movies for, you know, three to 12 months. So we get to do a lot more movies in a year than they do. But that being said, I mean, I definitely, I think, have been known now as being like a sci-fi action guy, which I'm perfectly fine with because I love that genre, uh, both as a, you know, film watcher, but also it's a great, it's a, it's a great creative breeding ground for what we do. So a lot of times when we're we're talking to professionals like yourselves and you know somebody younger who's just starting out is watching this and they'll hear you talk about you know in this case Skywalker Sound or being on some of the big mix stages that you work on in your you know in, the, in your natural habitat sometimes you can you can have that feeling of like well they're so far removed from what I do 
Um, you know, I would love to be where they are, but the tools that I have at my disposal right now and the type of projects I'm doing now are so different, yet you've all sort of said, uh, it's not so much different whether I'm on an indie thing or on a bigger thing. Well, here we all are now having to work from home. Um, I know you're all still working. I thought maybe it'd be fun to sort of go around the room, as it were, and just talk about what, what you're using at home and how it's different, really, from what you would be using, you know, if you're in the pro environment. So I don't know who wants to kick us off, maybe... Craig, why don't you, you tell us, you Craig's know, what got, Craig's got. The oh, well, home, home I'm, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty, I actually brought my sound design, you know, a studio, um, home, home with me. And I was very fortunate. I, I bought a house a few number of years ago and I had a big giant rec room in the back and I didn't quite know what I wanted to do with it. But, um, I was just, you know, I guess around late 2015, I was like, I'm going to build something at home. And, uh, I basically didn't want to build, I didn't want to build a studio like a theater. I didn't want to build a big black dark room because we tend to spend a lot of time in dark rooms. I wanted a creative space. I wanted a creative space, but I wanted the ability to be able to do as much high-end work as I can. So um, honestly, I put a budget together and I got a, you know, I got about a 14 foot screen and I have a little 16 fader S, uh, you know, an S6, uh, the M40, like our S40. Um, and, uh, a Mac pro HDX three and a matrix. And I got a projector that I put in the ceiling. I had an acoustician guy come out and, and we kind of did a lot of acoustic work on the room. And, um, you know, I have a, basically a small seven dot two, no, seven dot one dot four, I guess is my basic, uh, home Atmos system. I use the Dolby Atmos bridge, uh, to be able to monitor with the Dolby Atmos, um, you know, software, the production software. And, uh, so, so Craig, you're kind of in, blowing the curve know. for us. On this. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. I know. I, I, well, in his natural environment right now. I mean, I, yeah, I, I actually want, yeah, I actually literally staring at my, my, my desk. I mean, honestly for me, Matt, it, it came, it was born out of a need. Um, I, I tend you know, I've been, I was based at Fox for a long time. Uh, and then, um, I kind of would go to New York a lot. I'd come home, I started doing other projects, uh, streaming, like Netflix and streaming and uh, a project called Stranger Things that I started in 20, early 2016 kind of came along. So the need for me to do high-end work at home uh, was pretty, pretty apparent pretty quickly. And the fact is, you know, we all, because we've all spent a lot of time on dub stages and really high-end sound design rooms, it kind of sucks to go back to just a little, a little smaller room, you know? So you want to feel like what, you know, Will, both Will and Eileen mentioned earlier about mixing early, like mixing, um, adding reverbs and EQ and stuff. Well, you can only really do those things if you're in a room that you can kind of trust and you kind of know, and that's where this sort of was born out of, you know, and, and the technology and specifically Avid technology has allowed me really to, to be able to do that from home. Okay. So maybe, Maybe Will and Eileen, you have something as, as grandiose as what Craig's got set up, or maybe it's a <laughs> somewhat smaller scale. Well, I've got a very similar room to Craig at work. <laughs> yeah. So my my normal room is like Craig's home studio, basically. Um, it's like a nine one six Atmos room with Myers and um, and all the same stuff, Matrix and S six and very very similar room to Craig's. He's got the JBL M twos, and I've got the Meyer Ashrons. But other than that, it's it's in the you know Fracking very the same. we send stuff back and forth all the time and it sounds great. Um, at home, I've got uh, just a seven one system, and I've got an HDX three and an S a couple S ones and a dock, and um, I've got the JBL seven oh eights for my speakers, and um, it actually works great. I mean, I I'm missing having Atmos. I wish I had pulled the trigger on that a little earlier. But, um, you know, maybe I'll have some time to put that in now. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Eileen? Um, at, at work, um, yeah, it's kind of like, it's seven one um, Meyer, um, Asheron, and some else. And um, still, they, at Fox, they um, still had those, um, I think, it's the command, the icon. And, um, you know, it's only sometimes then, you know, get to move into the other room that has an Essex in there um, with Atmos. Um, and uh, while at home, because it was like a very last minute setup for me, um, but I had 
bought different gears um, over the years. So uh, just quickly set up something with um, a trash can Mac Pro, uh, HDX3, uh, Omni um, 708s for my uh, France, and um, just temporarily just put two other um, <laughs> at the speaker in the surround. So it's just like a five one. And then um, for now, uh, using an artist mix and um, uh, artist control that I had years ago. Yeah. But thinking about an ethics. There's like a full updates, full so. gamut of avid products there for you, Matt. Like yeah, oh, no, from the thanks. artist mix to like. I mean, the, in, the reality is, uh, it really is what lets us keep working at home is that we can mix at home, you know, we, as long as you've got a decent set of speakers and you've got a fast enough computer, you know, it's the same tools that we use all day at work. We're just in a smaller room. Right. And I guess that's the point I was trying to get to, hopefully, yeah. and I think we did, is that, and you, you really did say this already, it is all about scale. Like, you can do the same kind of work, and even more importantly, you know, do it on a basic system. So if, I, if I'm doing independent film and I'm just starting out, I might, you know, start out on a simple, I got my laptop and maybe a small control service like an S1 and my Pro Tools and I do my mix and then I can bring it to Eiling or Craig or Will and they have, you know, their talents and their full complement of tools and everything just sort of translates. You know, one thing that was a recurring theme through what you each talked about was surround sound. And I would kind of curious to know how your worlds have changed and how your techniques have changed as surround sound has evolved from... 5.1 to 7.1 to now Dolby Atmos. Does that change what you do and what you're able to do and your approach to sound design and mixing? Definitely for mixing. Um, I would say, personally, I haven't changed my design approach very much for Atmos. You know, there's the occasional um, thing where I'll, you know, make something specifically or cut something specifically for the ceiling. But a lot of times I'm making those choices as I'm going through the reel and mixing. It's certainly a much broader and higher resolution canvas to paint on. Um, we had a lot of fun on this uh, Invisible Man movie because the director, on like day two, I was panning something and I sort of panned somebody walking and just had, kept him going off the screen. He's like, wait a minute, we can do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then you can see like, you know, wait a minute, I can put a sound anywhere I want. And then it, he was off to the races and then everything was panning. And it's probably like your experience on Roma, right? Oh, Roma was for sure like that. Uh, you know, I've I've been in rooms where I've actually tried to hide the RMU a little bit from the mm -hmm. director so they don't actually start following the yellow balls around the yeah. the GUI because like, no, 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 the movie's on. The, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. <laughs> there were some points in, in there were some points in some movies in Roma specifically, and Alfonso was so great about it because. You know, for all of us bringing our talents to the table and all these things of like what we can do for for film and sound for film, it's really we really need a director that's going to embrace that and really it's really about supporting their vision sonically um, in and what they want to do. And Alfonso was one of those guys that he might not know the tools and but he knew he knew exactly how he wanted his movie to sort of sound and uh, and and I was just part of the team to help him achieve that sort of thing. Um, God, there were times on Roma where we were more concerned about what was going on off screen and, and, and more, you know, we would spend so much time on something that was up in the left surround and, and how it would come down, you know, and using the height ceilings in a way that I don't think a lot of films have, you know, but that film supported it. That film gave you the time. It was a very, you know, slow moving film. The camera moved slowly. He, you know, all the music was in radios and televisions. So therefore, you know, the whole idea of, of how sound interacts with an audience member and how sound interacts with the human ear. Um, I, th I think it was Walter Murch that spoke about this years and years ago about how, you know, the human human hearing, you can only detect what, two sound or three sounds or three Two or apps, three sounds at the same two time. Two yeah. at the same time. Yeah. And, uh, and that is something, you know, that, we can do the best sound in the world and uh but if it gets if if you know a massive orchestra comes crashing through the door and <laughs> they want to hear all that sound but they also want to hear all these other sounds um as great as dolby atmos is um once you start filling up all those channels with all those sort of things it, it, it kind of just becomes well i guess that was impressive but i don't know if it feels the, it doesn't i don't know if it has the same effect as it would as if you 
you know, had one mono or one simple sound, like Will said, his footsteps walking off, you know, to the side of the, you know, to the side of the screen. It's, it's like, how many notes can you play on a guitar versus playing the sort of right notes, you know, I guess is, right. is kind of, and that's kind of what I think the three of us bring to, to a director, you know, and, and doing sound design early on helps us focus those notes. It helps us focus those sounds and then playing them on the canvas of what surround sound or Dolby Atmos or, or, or whatever, you know, whatever format you're sort of working in, it just really becomes, how do you use the environments that you're presented with? Um, and for us, budgets haven't gotten any bigger a lot of times, um, yeah. but, but the demands have. So the three of us having spaces at home that have the capabilities of like doing all this, you know, work so that when we actually do get onto a mix stage, um, we got a leg up on it. We have, we're not scrambling just to get things organized and panned and stuff because there's so much panning that goes on nowadays. It's like, God, I, you know, sometimes I get up and I'm like, God, if I got to pan another gunshot or another <laughs> car buy or another whoosh buy, I'm going to jump off a bridge, but <laughs> you know, it's painting, it's kind of just painting here and painting there little by little. And you're building up this sort of, you know, sonic painting you know and and that that's how i look at atmos i you know i look at the i look at the room and 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 the objects and how it sort of you know how it sort of situates and you can kind of you know you kind of can sit there and you can kind of paint to your heart's content well the irony is if you jumped off that bridge will would have to pan the scream as you're going down <laughs> right exactly <laughs> sure, yeah. and then and then and then where would you put the body splat would the body splat be in the center or would it be on the right or depends you know, on the director it depends on go. the director yeah so we've talked a little bit about, you know, Greg, your work in comedy, Will, in, in the sci-fi stuff. Uh, First Man has come up a few times, but uh, I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, if we could, Eileen, about La La Land, because yeah. a big, lavish musical like that, how much more of a challenge was that for you, or how did that change uh, the type of work you do or your approach to, to your process? Um, I think because of that movie, um, I also got approached, you know, uh, fortunately, I, you know, sometimes I um, been approached for movies and um, I've been getting more um, musicals um, offers and um, they are all fun uh, in different ways um, different challenges and um, so say with La La Land um, for that film um, because Damien was uh, inspired by some French New Wave films and so we like go through the film and um, in different moments, at different moments, um, we can like pick sounds that uh, I could add different slaps and verbs um, that res that bounces around the room just to feel the scale of the city. Um, like say when Mia is like um, walking around the city um, after, you know, they tow her car off their party. Um, or... Uh, even down to dance fully. Um, so to work with the choreographer um, when you know, and Sebastian were like dancing on the hills, um, you know, around sunset time. Um, and uh, for that, you know, um, one go for um, film, um, you know, dance fully sounds. And so we got dancers on the stage. And um, I've learned that, like, you know, typically, you know, okay it's just done fully but uh, that's so much you could do it's almost like its own percussion instrument um, and with the dancers you know it's like what kind of what weighted shoes tap shoes what surface for the you know to create the right sounds and different steps that you could cheat the rhythm to play with the music and also then you gotta cheat the sync and you know different things like that um, and also going from real to to something like surreal in your head kind of moments um, uh, so it was a lot of fun or even like to create that opening um, of the film that came about at the last minute um, that sometimes we get more fortunate enough like you know they would they'll go I want you know to I wanted to establish like where you are, it's basically you're in Los Angeles in the traffic jam, and um, to build it up and introduce it with sound and walk up something like a sound montage, and then we'll figure out how long 
of the opening to have. And um, so, um, so, so it took a lot of revisions and it was a very last minute decision of them. Uh, it happened during the final mix too. But yeah, it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and, you know, like Craig said, you know, um, I started off just wanting to work in sound for the movie. So um, not really, really in a particular genre. <laughs> Um, it just happened to be so um, just really fortunate. Well, and it's yeah, I've never had the the fortune to do a musical. I'd love to someday, but I don't know about you guys, but I find all the time that I'm once we get the real music, I'm often nudging sounds around a little bit in the final mix to make things hit beats because it just oh, makes it yeah. all sure. like sit together for sure. Yeah. Um, I remember a million years ago when we were doing uh, Ratatouille. Um, we had lots of scenes with, um, you know, cooking and lots of tons and tons of Foley. And especially like when all the rats are cooking in the end, you know, just it was a Foley fest. And we we put it all up and we 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 cut it and we mixed, we pre-mixed it. And we got to the final mix and and put it up against the music. And it was like, shit, <laughs> this doesn't work at all. <laughs> so we... <laughs> Had to go back, and once we had Michael Giacchino's actual score for the scenes, we actually had to go through and recut all the Foley to be musical sync rather than literal sync. And as soon as we did that, it just it just sat in, and it sounded fun instead of sounding kind of like messy and and annoying. Um, so it, I was just gonna say, let us play the Foley louder than we probably would have been able to otherwise. Regardless of the type of film that you're doing. Um, and I thought it was interesting, Craig, you brought up the, the Walter Murch quote about being able to only hear so many sounds at a time. Where do you, what do you start with? What type of sound do you, how do you layer, I guess is what I'm asking. Cause you know, in picture again, it's pretty straightforward. I have the, the source footage, the camera footage of the performance. And then I might build on that some visual effects or some comps, but in sound, you have so many layers to work with and so many elements to work with. Do you have a process where you say, okay, I'm going to start with like maybe some kind of room tone or how, how, where do you begin? Um, my, my approach for a long time was very literal of, uh, like you just said, starting with, with, uh, the foundation and the foundation for me, especially in sound effects is, is having ambiences, having, having the world created. Uh, so I, you know, and I still do it to this day where I'll start doing it. Um, I'll start a background pass. And then I'm just filling in room tones and, and winds and airs and city. And, you know, um, what that allows me to do is twofold. It allows me to sort of start cutting, uh, you know, so I'm, I'm following the picture edit, right? So I'm, I'm able to sort of have it blocked out, which for one allows me editorially to quickly replace that sound with something else if I don't like it because I've already done the fade in and the fade out and I've already done the crossfade to another scene or whatever. So I blocked it out. And that's that's sometimes getting that first layer of, of paint on and then you can kind of look at, okay, well, I want a little less red here. I want a little less black he over here. Um, and then it also allows me to sort of spot the movie a second or third time. Like I can actually watch the scenes as I'm laying in backgrounds or, or, or just, just any ambiences and I can drop markers and, and hundreds of markers of thoughts of ideas or of stuff I want to sort of go record or stuff I want to sort of like find from a library. Um, and that sort of gives me sort of a base, um, it just gives me a starting a starting point. Not every, not every film is like that, um, but I generally sort of try to build from a, from a foundation of backgrounds and atmospheres that quite often I'll actually then mute out half of them, you know, um, because I because I won't need them. Um, I think I can't speak for Eileen and Will. I, I sometimes I feel like I overcutting is not the right word, but I, I might sometimes build too many things. But the definition of editor and the definition of, of sound designer and editing and stuff, I feel, is the, is the process of reduction. Um, and and I, I love exploring. I love sort of like, you know, just putting a lot of stuff in sometimes, maybe not even in sync sometimes, actually just throwing, you know, certain sounds in like randomly, like, a you know, like a bunch of car horns or, or something in a city scene. Um, not even riffing off of anything on the picture, just riffing sonically. And then I quite often just will go back and sort of say that I like that. 
I tend to mute a lot of things when I get into the middle of the process because I'm like, oh, I don't like that today. I'll mute it. I'll never delete it because maybe during the, the pre-mix, I might light it back up and go, oh, that actually works really well. And it works really, really well if I put it up in the ceiling. So, I mean, there's so, it's so, those sort of like thought process sort of start, start that way. And it also allows me to think about the sound design a little bit. Um, it allows me to sort of just sort of get into the project um in a, in a way that i'm accomplishing some things that i know need to be done like room tones and all the bare necessities of, of a lot of films need all these things they need atmospheres and they need room tones and they need winds and airs and city sounds and depending on what the movie is um so as you're cutting that why not be thinking about sort of the sound design and the other aspects of of what it is that you're working on so i know if we were doing this actually at south by southwest in front of an audience Invariably, there'd be questions about breaking into the business. So we'll just do a quick, to close things out, around round robin, any, any short bits of advice you might have for a young person, you know, a young version of you just starting out today. So Eileen, what, what advice would you have for somebody that wants to, to break into audio post for film and television? You know, uh, for the film sound business, it's a lot about like uh, knowing the people. So I would say, you know, um, do some try to do as much like short films or, you know, the more you do, the more you learn. Um, I know that nowadays, not because of added tools and technology, you know, say even if you don't have a chance to get your hands on a short film to work on, you know, some people uh, take like clips from YouTube or, or scenes from movies and rework them. And then so try to meet as many people as you can. And, um, you know, as long as I think you are passionate about what you do and, hardworking and a good team player and, um, you know, having those other work and practices, you know, they can be some good demos to show um, the, the people you're uh, meeting. And sometimes I tend to like to meet with the people and check out, you know, at, you know, at my office or something and check out the pro session to see how they work, how they lay things out. Um, but, yeah, just keep in touch with people. But, of course, you know, um, um, you know, um, just check every couple of months. Yeah, it's the fine line between being um, annoying and being persistent, yeah. right? I've heard that one before. Um, I, I think uh, for me, if if uh, if I had to give some just basic advice, I'd say really try to learn Pro Tools because if you can show up and help me set up a Pro Tools system or you know, troubleshoot something or just say, hey, can you work tape these recordings we just made? And I don't have to hold your hand and you can be useful for me on day one. You're probably going to have a better <laughs> chance of sticking around, you know, because the thing is, we're busy, you know, like it's uh, it's hard. You know, when people ask if they can come intern for us, it's like I always want to encourage people to come and learn and all that. But there's not a lot of time to just sit and teach somebody these days. So as long as you have a, some kind of foundation where you can watch and learn, uh, you know, that is, that's cool. But then also like know how to make a good cup of coffee, you know, how to like, you know, just be useful. I think that's, that's the best thing you can do when you're starting out. How about you, Craig? Right. I think, um, on top of obviously this great advice, I think watch a lot of movies, obviously watch a lot of shows. But also listen, and, and, and if you're watching a project and you really like a movie for a certain reason, try to listen to the sound and figure out why you like the sound. Figure out how it was done and what did they do. Like, you know, going way back to what Will said about the reverbs in the room or EQ, you know, you can watch a lot of movies and, and once you tune into things, you can kind of like really understand why they made certain choices. Um, that's something that I feel, you know, the art and the craft of what we do from sound effects and, and sound design you know, it's all great to know the technology. You have to know the technology, but you're also sort of expected to know the technology. But I also want to know what kind of voice you have, what kind of what kind of aesthetic do you have and stuff. So I, I would say you, you have to have both. Um, and if you can kind of, you know, do both, but and then also be energetic and be, you know, be a good person and, and be around and to be around somebody is an important thing because we, you know, we spend... We spend a lot of time on our own, but we also spend a lot of time collaborating and, and sort of you want to be able to work with people that you can relate to and trust and understand and, uh, and know that they're going to bring something to the table. Yeah. And good attitude. Good attitude. Yeah. yeah. Good yeah. attitude. Yeah. Yeah. Goes a long way. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, that's great advice from all of you and uh, certainly great information. I know you're all busy, even at home. Everyone's actually, it seems like being at home now, we're even busier. Yeah. I don't know how that works. Yes. Seems a little I mean, yeah. today's supposed to be a, a union holiday, but uh, I bet everybody's just working anyway, because what else are we going to do? What else are you going to do? <laughs> exactly. Well, what, what you chose to do was spend some time with me talking about the psychology of sound and your work, and I can't thank you enough. And hey, next year, let's do this in Texas. Hey, there you go. Yeah, sounds good. Awesome. I'm down. <laughs> thank you, Matt. Thank you. Well, there you have it. I hope you enjoyed our little deep dive into the world of audio post-production. I know that I did. I want to give a big shout out to Eiling, Will, and Craig for spending some time with us. It would have been really cool to do the panel at South by Southwest in Austin, Texas. Uh, but this was pretty fun too, and I appreciate them dropping by. Who knows, maybe next year we'll get together at South by. Now, when we were talking about everybody's home recording setup, you might have heard Will mention that he has the Avid S1. This is a really cool little eight fader mixer. Uh, that you can use with an iPad or an Amazon Fire tablet or a Samsung tablet, you name it. And the cool thing about it is it doesn't just work with Pro Tools. It works with pretty much any digital audio workstation and also with Media Composer and pretty much any nonlinear editor. So I'll put a link to it in the show notes because it's a really cool piece of gear and you should check it out. So what did you think of today's episode? Did you like uh, learning a little bit more about audio post-production? Should we take a little tour around visual effects or some other disciplines in the post-production world? Let me know. I always do what I can to incorporate any feedback you give me. And with that, I'm going to get back to work on the next podcast. I hope you and your family and friends all stay safe and healthy, and you're not going too crazy sitting there at home. Who knows, maybe this podcast helped a little. That's going to do it for me today. This is Matt Fury thanking you once again for joining me right here on The Rough Cut. <laughs>